afraid of the darkness when my eyes are fixed on you and I'm never disappointed when I trust that you come through cause you always do you always do and I welcome to chapel at hardin simmons university here at HSU, we value the importance of gathering together as a community of faculty, staff, and students to worship God and encourage one another in our Christian walk. This weekly time together is an opportunity for us to grow as a community of worshipers as we study the Word of God, engage with dynamic speakers, and learn to do life together. No matter who we are or where we've come from, this is our time to learn, grow, serve, love, and worship. Welcome to chapel. We're so glad you're here. Hi, I'm Chaplain Mike Hale. I am currently serving in the Army here in Alaska. This is my wife, Tracy Cruz Hale. We are alumni of the class of 96, and we desire to just give you a prayer and blessing for this year. So Lord, I just lift up the students of Hardin Simmons to you, God. I know you hold them close to your heart. I pray that this year would be full of success in their studies, uh, fulfillment in their relationships. I pray that they would draw closer to you, God, that you would show them more of your heart for them. And I pray, God, that you would just continue to guide them into the future that you have for them. In Jesus' name. In this days when hope has really been kind of struggling with everything that's going on in the world, Afghanistan, COVID, uh, God is really reminding me that we have hope as believers, Christians, because Jesus is alive. So I just bless you that you, have made, you may know the hope of Christ and that be fueling you for this year and cause you to be lights in very dark places. In Jesus' name. Yeah, good morning, guys. Isn't that so cool that we just get to hear from um, just our alumni that love our school and that love us and get to just pray over us? Um, that's just really awesome encouragement. I hope that was a good encouragement for you guys. Um, now we're going to move into a time of worship, so I'm going to invite you all to stand and sing with us. Oh, oh, oh. 
chorus one more time together.
this, God, that we can rest in that, that you are constant and you never change, God, and you are always Lord in our lives, Jesus. God, I thank you that we can just declare that we are your children, Jesus. We, you have called us by name and you have a purpose for every single one of us. God, and I just pray that, God, we can realize that in all the hardships and the struggles that we have in this world and in this crazy college life that's new for a lot of people, but I just pray that, God, we can just rest in that, that we are your children and that you have us and you take us by the hand. And God, you know us, you know our hearts, you call us by name, and I just thank you for that and for your grace. God, I thank you for this opportunity that we just, that we get to worship your name and just declare those things. So Lord, we love you, and I pray that, God, that the rest of this week that we can go out and just glorify you in everything that we do and every person that we encounter, God, that we can just show love to them because we are all your children. I just thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. so excited to begin our 2021 Cornerstone Lecture Series today. Um, I want to remind you that today is not all that we have. We have two more sessions uh, tomorrow at 940 and Thursday at 930 right here in Barron's. I'm so grateful to get to introduce to you our speaker this year, Oza Jones Jr. Oza is a gifted communicator of the gospel message with extensive outreach, pastoral, and community involvement experience. He serves as the director of African American Ministries for Texas Baptists. Oza seeks to see the local church totally connected and involved in all areas of the community. So we are thankful to have uh, you here with us today and over the next few days. And Oza, we're thankful to have you on campus today. And we're looking forward to hearing what God has put on your heart to share with us today. So would you give Oza Jones a big HSU welcome? Thank you, Tanner. Tanner is my new best friend. Thank God for you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bruntmeyer, for just the opportunity to come. Thank you for what you all mean to Texas Baptist, and it's a blessing to be here. Now, uh, I have family in Abilene. As a matter of fact, my mother is in Abilene. She wanted to come today, but she's COVID scared, so she didn't come today. She really wanted to come. We lived about two blocks from here, so I need y'all to do something for me. If y'all can make me happy and my mother real happy, can we make some noise for Jesus? And maybe my mother can hear it just a couple of blocks. Y'all can do better than that. Hey Amen. It's a blessing to be here with you all again and to share these next few days. So we don't have that much time, so let's jump right in. If you have your Bibles or your device, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, and we'll look at verses 1 through 9. And uh, we want to talk just from uh, this thought for these next few days about divine interruptions. Divine interruptions. Isaiah chapter 6, we'll look at verses 1 through 9. Now, let me know you're there by saying amen. Amen. If you're still looking, say hold up. Y'all have, y'all have tablets. Y'all should be there by now. Y'all ready? Y'all got to talk back. Are y'all ready? Isaiah chapter 6, starting in verse 1. In the year that King Isaiah died, I also saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood a seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flew. One cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. Everybody say filled with smoke. 
So I said, whoa, everybody say, whoa. It's me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim uh, flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the tongs of the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. He said, go and tell this people who keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing but do not perceive. Father, have your way. Speak to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Divine interruptions. I hate interruptions. I know hate is a strong word, but I hate interruptions. My grandmother taught me you have two ears and one mouth. That means you should listen more than you talk. And when she's talking, you listen. And when I talk, you'll listen to me. Don't give me this um, pardon the interruption or I hate to interrupt you. If you hate to interrupt me, then why are you interrupting me? I hate interruptions, but God is oftentimes in the interruptions of life and seldom is he in the plans of life. I'll say it again. Oftentimes God is in the interruptions of life and seldom is he in the plans of life. You've heard it said before, tell God, if you want to make God laugh, tell God your plans. I have a problem with interruptions, but Jesus does his best work in interruptions. I'll prove it to you. When Jesus was in the boat, he told the disciples, let's get in the boat and go to the other side. They got in the boat, they got ready to go to the other side, and a great windstorm came. Y'all know that story. You learned it. Even if you flunked Sunday school, you know that. You know that story. So they get in the boat, they go to the other side, and a great storm comes, but Jesus falls asleep in the boat. And as Jesus is asleep in the boat, the disciples, they are tripping. They don't know what to do. They, they, they think that they're about to die. And I don't know who goes to wake Jesus up. I, I don't think it was John. I, I don't think it was Andrew. It was probably Peter because Peter was the thug of the disciples. And so Peter goes probably and wakes Jesus up. And Jesus wakes up. Now, there's one thing you can mess with me or there's one area you can bother me in. But one thing you don't want to mess with is a brother's sleep. They wake Jesus up. Jesus gets up, speaks to the winds and waves, and says, peace be still. Why? Because he specializes in the interruptions of life. Y'all remember when uh, Jairus, the synagogue ruler, came to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, I need you to come get my daughter. My daughter, she's lying at the point of death. I need you to come and touch her. And as Jesus is headed to Jairus' house to heal his daughter, a woman with the issue of blood comes, and she crawls to Jesus, and she interrupts Jesus. Jesus stops and deals with the woman with the issue of blood. But what does Jesus do? Even when he gets to the house, the girl is dead and he gets the girl up. Why? Because Jesus specializes in interruptions. I got one more. Remember when uh, Mark, uh, in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 2, when there was a paralytic that was lying outside the house and Jesus was preaching inside the house and the paralytic needed to get in the house. So four men come and pick the paralytic up and get him to Jesus, but they can't get through the front door. So they crawl on top of the roof and dig in the roof. Now, here it is. Jesus is preaching. The greatest preacher that ever preached, the greatest disciple that ever discipled, the greatest man who ever lived is preaching in the house, and they are now digging through the roof. Dirt and dust is coming through the roof, interrupting Jesus while he's preaching. And what does Jesus do? Once they get the man to Jesus, he heals him, he forgives him, and he sends him home with a new, fresh pair of legs. Why? Because Jesus specializes in interruptions. Not only, I, I, I one more, I, I, I lied. I, I, that, that, that one, I got one more. Jesus' first miracle was at a wedding. The wedding is going good. They got the after party. And when they get to the after party, 
every good after party has to have alcohol. I, I know Dr. Dr. Bruntline, don't y'all not gonna invite me back. Every good, every good after party has got and, and, and they run out of alcohol. They run out of alcohol. That's a show enough interruption. They bring Jesus. Jesus takes the, the water and turns it into Patron. Why? Because he, he specializes in interruptions. And in this text, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is dealing with a major interruption. King Isaiah is dead. Now, everything was good when King Isaiah was on the throne. Um, the, 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 the army was good. Businesses were good. Uh, as my granddaddy would say, every pot had a chicken in it when King Isaiah was on the throne. But now King Isaiah is dead. Isaiah has to deal with a great loss in his life. Some say he was kindred. Some say he was just a mentor to Isaiah. Whichever way, Isaiah is hurt. His heart is broken because Isaiah is dead. And it's at this interruption in his life that he has this epiphany where he actually looks up. Matter of fact, that's point number one. Isaiah, in this divine interruption, he has an upward observation. Let's, let's look at the text real quick. In the year King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Isaiah is at the worst point of his life, and at this point, he has an upward observation. I know you don't want anyone else to know today, but perhaps you're dealing with some bad situations in your life right now. You don't, you don't want anybody to know. You're going to front like it's all good, but you're dealing with some crazy things in your life right now. Maybe you're a freshman and you feel homesick. Maybe you've been here forever and it feels like you're never going to finish, or maybe you don't have enough money. Maybe your classes cost more than the money that you have. I don't know what your issue may be, but you may be in a bad place. Can I go ahead and encourage you today that when you're in the worst place of life, you ought to have an upward observation. Isaiah sees God. When you're at your lowest point, that's the time when you look up. Isaiah, his very, his name means strength. In other words, in the text, Isaiah is saying, in the year my strength died, I, I, I thought our economy was strong. I, I, I thought our, our medical field was strong. I thought our school system was strong. COVID, COVID exposed everything that was not Strong In those moments where my strength left me, Isaiah has this upward observation where he sees God. Not only does he see God, but he sees God sitting. That's what the text says. I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a throne. I got to, I got, I, I got to be honest with you. I had a problem in the text right there because it's at the worst point of Isaiah's life and God is sitting down. God is chilling when I'm in the worst part of my life. God is parlaying. God, 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 God is sitting down. But it also blesses me because it lets me know that God is not moved by the issues that are in my life. He's, he's not, he's, 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 he's not wondering what he needs to do. He's not pacing the floor, scratching his head. He's, he's not on Google trying to figure it out. He's not on Pinterest trying to come up with a way that he can get us through. But God is sitting on the throne because he's still the king of glory. So even though King Uzziah died, the king is still sitting on the throne. Isaiah has an upward observation. He sees God, and when he sees God, he's sitting. But not only is he sitting, he's satisfying. The text says that the train of his robe fills the temple. The train of his robe fills fills the temple. Can y'all see Isaiah? Isaiah is looking up with this upward observation. He has pain and heartbreak in his life, but he sees God. And when he sees God, he's sitting. But not only is he sitting, he's satisfying. The train of his robe filled the temple. In other words, God had more train than he had temple. There was an overflow of train. Okay, let me say it like this. According to customs and manners, when one king would go to war with another king, the king who won would go to the king who lost and cut his robe off and sew it onto the king's robe that won. I'll say it again. I used to be slow, too. I know y'all are overwhelmed with class. 
Kings would go to war with other kings. The king who won would go to the king who lost, cut his robe off, and sew it onto his king. In other words, the reason why the train of his robe was so long was because he never loses. He always wins. That's encouraging for me because in my lowest point, in my upward observation, I see God. I see him sitting, but I also see him satisfying. God can satisfy every area of your life if you'll let him. He has more train than you have temple. Isaiah not only has an upward observation, but Isaiah also has an inward transformation. Look at the text. I'm not making this up. Y'all looking at me funny. Chapter 2. Above it stood a seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door was shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah has an upward observation, but then he has this inward transformation. You, you can't see God without seeing yourself. As a matter of fact, Isaiah, <clears throat> Isaiah sees God's righteousness, and then he sees his own wretchedness. He sees God, and after he sees God, he says, whoa. I, I, Isaiah catches some type of contact as he looks at God in the upward observation. I'll say it again. Isaiah catches contact. In the text it says, the house was filled with smoke. Now, I, I might show enough get kicked out of Harden Simmons for this here, but I'm going to go here. Um, I have a lot of issues. I've had a lot of issues. I, I have a lot of issues. We, if you be honest with yourself, you don't have to look at me in that tone of voice. You got issues too. Uh, I've had a lot of issues, but one of my issues has never been smoking weed. I never had an issue getting high, really. Everybody got real, y'all got real tight when I said weed. But my friend, my friend, I won't say his name, but my friend when we were in high school, he was the first one to have the car, so we all rode with him naturally, right? And he was a, he was a smoker. He, he, he was an everyday smoker. He, he woke up, got high, went to school, got high, got out of school, got high, went to play basketball, got high. He was always... Smoking, And so he would be smoking in the car when we would come and get in the car. And even though I wasn't smoking, I would sometimes get high off contact because the smoke filled the car. What Isaiah is saying in the text, he's saying that, that the Lord smoke, his, his glory, his, 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 his splendor had filled the room in such a way that Isaiah catches contact. And as he catches contact, he's convicted. He says, whoa. Isaiah got a hold of that whoa. Let me, let me say it like this. What I've already enjoyed at Hardin Simmons is the fact that the worship team comes together and they were so excited that you were coming and they prepared for you and they were ready for you to come because they want to get God here. So this place is filled with smoke. So even if you just came here to get a credit, you still might get high off contact. I, I need to cut across the field right here. God wants to do something amazing with you. You didn't plan on being here today. Maybe you don't even want to be here today, but you're here today. God interrupted your life, and it could be divine that he wants to do something amazing with you. Isaiah has an upward observation. Then he has this inward transformation. As a matter of fact, the text says that, uh, that the angelic being, the one uh, who flew, the seraphim, they had a live coal in their hand, which was taken from the altar, and he touched Isaiah's mouth with it. And as they touched Isaiah's mouth, he says, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. I don't care what you've done in life. God wants you to have an inward transformation so he can do something supernatural in your life. 
His sin is purged. Isaiah, after having this upward observation, he has this inward transformation. And then Isaiah has an outward demonstration. Here it is in the text. Look at verse 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. And he said, Go and tell. After Isaiah has this upward observation where he sees God, he has an inward transformation where he sees himself. Then he'll have this outward demonstration where he can see others. He has this outward demonstration where he says, Lord, I'll go. That's really what I couldn't wait to get to this morning. Because God has created you, he formed you, and he knew you before you were in your mother's womb. And he had a destiny, he had a design, and a purpose, and an assignment for your life. And I don't care what interruptions come in your life, God is still trying to use you to do what? It's in the text. He's at least trying to use you to go and tell. This outward demonstration, Isaiah says, here am I. Here I am suggests you tell me what to do, I'll do it. But here am I suggests, Lord, before you tell me what to do, I've already said yes. I don't know what you came to this university for. I don't know why God called you here. I don't know why you're here right now, but I believe we're all in this space as a divine interruption for us to have an upward observation where we see God, an inward transformation where we see ourselves, and an outward demonstration where we can see others, at least to go and tell. I'll finish with this story, true story. In New Orleans, there was a um, recreation center in New Orleans, and at this recreation center, they had went an entire summer with no drowning. They went 11 weeks, no drowning. No one drowned in the pool at the recreation center all summer. So they wanted to celebrate the fact that they had no drownings that year. So naturally what they did, they had a pool party. So they have a pool party, they have uh, over 200 certified lifeguards, and they have six lifeguards on duty. And as they're partying, partying, as they're at the party, they get to the end of the party, and they're cleaning up, and they find Jerome Moody, age 31, fully clothed, dead in the deep end. My question is, how is it that someone could die in a swimming pool from drowning while being surrounded by over 200 certified lifeguards? I don't know how many people we have on this campus, but I'm talking to the saved people right now, the people who know who Jesus is and have Allow Jesus to come into your life and take over your life. Don't go through these years of college and have dead people dying around you while God has given you his gift of eternal life. God uses divine interruptions to get us in the perfect space and place for him to use us. Thank God for divine interruptions. Father, we thank you today. We thank you that you use interruptions in our lives to put us, navigate us in the perfect space where you can use us. Father, I pray over every student, every professor, staff, faculty, I pray over this entire campus Number one, that if someone doesn't know you as their personal Savior, Lord, that they would come to an inward transformation, a woe, where they would see who you are. And we pray 
and ask that you would save them. Lord, I pray for those who are saved, who have not yet grasped this go and tell that you're telling all believers to do. Father, I pray that they would get it. We honor you. We thank you. We adore you. We exalt you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.